All right, good evening, everybody. Dr. Todd Williams joining you live here tonight on this Monday, April 19th, 2021. It is my pleasure and my privilege to be here with you tonight here for Wisdom Talk with Dr. Paul Kreitz. I'm your guest host tonight, filling in for Dr. Kreitz. He's not able to be here with us, so we are going to have a great time tonight as I'm guest hosting tonight again on this Monday night. If you're joining me live tonight, please let me know you're here so that I can say hello to you and uh, give me a thumbs up and a heart. We're going to be talking tonight about the wisdom of worship. That's right, the wisdom of worship. Uh, just got done with a workout and a shower, so uh, I'm probably a little bit still kind of sweating, but, uh, it felt good to, to get out and enjoy the weather for today. I hope you're doing well. I hope, uh, that you've had a great Monday. I hope you had a great weekend as well as we spent uh, a good bit of our weekend celebrating my wife's birthday and, uh, she had taken the day off and I believe she's still out planting flowers and trees and shrubs. That's what she loves to do. She loves to plant flowers uh, in our yard. So I hope you've been having a great day as well. Hope everybody is doing well. Tonight I'm going to go, be going back to uh, John 4 tonight. I started this last night talking from uh, John chapter 4, St. John and I was talking to you about the woman at the well. And uh, Jesus had said, the hour is coming and now is that the true worshipers, they shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Good evening, Prophet Doolin. Glad you're here with me. Haven't seen you lately Maybe we can catch up sometime in the near future. All right, I'm going to begin talking about this with you tonight. I, I want to look at one verse of scripture, so I hope you've got a Bible handy. I'm going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, just one one single verse. Most most of the time, this chapter is called uh, the, the uh, chapter about faith. But I want to point out one verse of scripture in this chapter, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, about worship, about worship tonight. And this is verse 21. It's Hebrews eleven twenty-one. 21. It says, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, he blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. I had the Holy Spirit last week whisper those words to me that Jacob worshiped while leaning upon his staff. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. I'm going to continue talking with you about worship. Last night I gave a challenge to everyone uh, to come into the same mind this week the same agreement to begin pursuing worship. And I told you that uh, God, that we both have to search out God and allow him to search us out. And I'm just going to jump right into this tonight, all right? Worship is a means for us. I'm going to give you four things tonight. And this, this is not one of them, but I'm going to give you four things tonight that start with an S to help you remember some things about worship and what they bring it brings into our life. Worship uh, is a means by which we lean on in the journey of our life or through life. Let me say that one more time. Worship is a means 
by which we lean upon in our journey through life. Now, I'm bringing this up to you because of what Hebrews 11.21 said. Stop with me and think about this for just a few minutes. Let's get all in the, the same train of mind tonight. The Bible says that by faith, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, he blessed both the sons of Joseph, which would have been Ephraim and Manasseh, and he worshiped while leaning upon the top of his staff. Now, this isn't the first time that the Bible records Jacob worshiping. There's something here for us to extract from this. And as I'm getting started, give me just give me a moment. I'm kind of like one of those locomotive trains. You know, I, I have to get going. But once I get going, I'm I'm going to be going. Worship does something in our present. It is a means by which we are in an intimate relationship with God. But there is a measure in which we begin to trust God in our present. And we not only trust him in our present, but we trust him concerning the future and the eternal. Now I want you to think about this with Jacob. It says that by faith, when Jacob was dying, he's at the end of his life. He stretched out his hands to bless. And he, the Bible says that he literally had crossed his hands to bless the future. And he was worshiping, leaning upon the top of his staff. There's something that, that we begin to gather from this verse of scripture that our journey through life Worship is something that we can lean upon and that it's going to provide something in our life. Both in the present, the future, and the eternal. When we focus our attention, our mind. I'm talking to you tonight about the wisdom of worship. When we focus our worship into the very life of God. Now, I began last night talking to you about this and just to catch you up and get you up to speed with me if you weren't here. Jesus had an encounter with a woman at a well. And it was Jacob's well. She asked Jesus, are you greater than our father, Jacob, which dug this well for us? And last night I was telling you that, that worship is like a well. There's something that we can draw from it that can bring a refreshing into our life. I'm going to continue that thought with you tonight. But we found Jesus saying to the woman at the well, good evening, Tammy, glad you're here with us. The woman at the well, Jesus said to her that if she would drink of this water, she would never thirst again. And he said, these waters will be in you and be springing up unto you everlasting life. See, Jesus, the reason that I'm talking to you about worship is Jesus said, the Father is seeking such to worship him. 
who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The Father is seeking for such to worship him in spirit and in truth. In all that he becomes to us, there's a progressive revelation of God in our lives. Every time that that Abraham would worship God, he would build an altar and worship the Lord, the Lord would reveal himself in another name to him. Jehovah Rapha, and Elohim. It was a progressive revelation to Abraham of who God was. I'm going to draw all this together in just a few minutes, all right? All that he is then becomes the centerpiece of my life of who I am becoming. Let me say that again. All that he is, listen very closely to this, all that God is becomes the centerpiece for who I am becoming. This is why we have to begin to take on a relentless pursuit of God through worship. Let's say that one more time. This is why we begin a relentless pursuit of who God is through worship. Good evening, April. My lovely wife is joining us tonight. My pursuit of God must become relentless. So I'm going to give you four things right here tonight. Right here. Number one, somebody help me out put these in the chat stream. Number one is source. Source. All of these are going to start with an S. Because I want you to be able to remember these. As you approach worship. In worship, there's something that we are giving to God. We give him adoration. We give him exaltation. We extol him. We, we lift him up. We begin to speak to him in thanksgiving, gratitude, We begin to give God something that is due to him. Or I would call it, we give him due homage. There's something that's due to God. See, so worship cannot be based upon whether I feel like it or not. It's based upon that God is worthy of it. No matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, or no matter what is going on in my life, God is worthy to be praised. God is worthy to be worshiped. The word worship actually comes from the old English, uh, which is worthship. Worthship. He's due something. And we're giving something that is due to him. And that, that due homage that he is worthy of begins to do something in my life. It becomes a source, a supply. So if you want to remember it either way, a source or a supply. When I begin to give, listen, listen to this very closely. When I begin to give, it creates for me a source. Let me say that again. When I begin to give, it creates for me a source. This is something that I have found about worship. Last night I told you 
that worship was a great mystery to me. But these are some things that I've come to conclusions about concerning worship through pra the practice of worship, not just, you know, reading or studying, but by literally worshiping God. And, and these things began to manifest in my life. I began to recognize that worship became a source, a source of what? It began to be a source of inspiration for me. Most of the time when I receive inspiration from the Holy Spirit or I become inspired by God about something, I've typically either been in the place of prayer or the place of worship. I've typically been in the place of prayer or the place of worship and especially in the place of worship. Because most of the time in the, in the place of prayer, we're trying to receive something. But in the place of worship, we are giving something. And when we begin to give worship to the Lord, it creates for me, like what Jesus said to the woman of the well, there's something that will be in you that's like a wellspring of living water. Something begins, there begins to be a fountainhead, a source something begins to come forth for you. I found that inspiration and motivation and revelation began to bubble forth or they begin to spring up in my life. See, I'm convinced of this. God is the source of every good and perfect gift. Everything that comes down Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, the book of James says. But I know my God. You know, what, what can I give to the Lord that he doesn't already have? He, he owns the cattle on a thousand hill. You know, David said, uh, if, if it was sacrifices you desired, I would give it to you. But he said the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. When we come and begin to give worship to God, God begins to open up something for us. Something, something just opens up. Whenever we're giving to God, a source opens up and it's a source of inspiration. You know, I found that people, when they become down or discouraged, or depressed. I've told many people, this is the best place for you to begin to worship God. To begin to worship God. Just to throw up your hands and begin to worship God. You know, when we lift our hands to the Lord, it's actually a position where it's, I'm saying, I'm, I'm here to receive something from you. I'm receiving with open hands and an open heart. So number one was source. Number two is shape. Shape. Worship begins to shape or mold who I am becoming. Let me say that again. Worship begins to shape who I am becoming both in the present and in the future. I find it very interesting once again in Hebrews eleven twenty one that Jacob, while he was dying, he was worshiping and blessing the sons of Joseph, leaning on his staff. Worship had molded who Jacob become, became. And actually, he, he was later called Israel. God changed his name in the place of worship in Genesis 32. He worshiped God all night, wrestled with an angel, and it changed how he walked the rest of his life because it said that the, the angel touched him in the hollow of his thigh. See, worship will begin to change you. You can't come into the presence of God. I'm talking about you coming into the presence of Almighty God. I'm talking about the 
the presence of God manifesting in your life. See, I've, I've found about worship that worship is like an oasis. And when you begin to worship, you won't be worshiping alone because when you begin to create the atmosphere of worship, I've found that even the angels will come and join you because it is like an oasis for them for his presence. They are totally dependent upon his presence in their existence. God's presence is like the air of heaven. Without it, you would literally suffocate. And when they are in this earthly realm, if they can find someone who is worshiping, they will come and join you just to get in the manifest presence of the Lord. Now, some people say to me, you know, Todd, isn't God everywhere? Yes, God is everywhere. God is omnipresent, but God is not manifesting everywhere. God will begin to manifest himself. Jesus said that I and the Father will manifest ourselves unto you. See, when the, the manifest presence of God begins to open up around you, everything begins to change. We know through the scripture that God inhabits the praise of his people. It literally means that he comes and sits down or will seat himself. I read one time that the, the Japanese translation of the Bible says that God makes or that praise is a big chair for God to sit in. I don't know if you've ever been in the glory of God, the manifest glory of God. I have been in the manifest glory of God, the kabod of God. And it literally, the, the word glory in Hebrew means weight, the weighty presence of the Lord. I've been on, under the presence of the Lord and, and his, the, the weight of his presence was so heavy that it felt like it was crushing me crushing me. So number one was that worship becomes a source for us because I'm giving. As I'm giving worship to the Lord, something comes back. You, you, can't, you can't give and it not come back to you. God says, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over. Good measure. Whenever you give, something comes back. And I found in worship, what was given back to me was inspiration, motivation, and revelation. Number two tonight was shapes. Worship begins to shape who I am becoming, both now and futuristically. I was coming to you tonight from Hebrews 11.21, talking to you about Jacob. The third thing I found about worship is that it causes a shift. Somebody can put that in the chat stream tonight. Number one was source or supply. Number two, number two was shapes. It shapes who I'm becoming. It molds who I'm becoming. Number three was it shifts. Worship causes something to shift. What does it cause? To shift. It causes my focus to shift. This is big. This is huge. This is important. It shifts my focus from living a life of being self-centered or being bent upon my own personal sensations. And it shifts my focus onto a being that is much greater than myself. One that is to be emulated. Let me say that again. Worship begins to shift my focus. You know, Dr. Craig says, where your focus goes, 
your energy flows. Worship will begin to shift your attention, shift your focus from yourself, from being self-centered or, or seeking sensations. You know, personal, our, our culture is so caught up on, it's a sensate culture. And it shifts my focus onto someone much greater than myself, much higher than I am, much bigger than I am. I'm telling you some of the benefits of worship tonight. And number four tonight, I only had four that I was going to give you. Number four is settle. Each one of these started with an S. Worship is a source. Worship shapes. Worship causes a shift. And worship also settles. What do I mean by that? It brings a settling just think about Jacob again once more. It says that by faith, when Jacob was dying, here he is, we find him worshiping. He's blessing the sons of Jacob, laying hands on them, and worshiping, leaning upon the top of his staff. What I've found about worship is that it creates for me a resting spot. A place for me to also stop and reflect. A place for me to rejuvenate spiritually. It's like a pool, an oasis. It's like a well, a place to draw from, a place where I stop and I, I give worship to the Lord. I settle for a moment. I build an altar to the Lord. I make a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of worship. This, uh, this place of giving also becomes a place of refreshing for me. This is the place I get refreshed. You know, the, the Bible tells us not to become weary in well-doing. Sometimes we can become weary. We can become workers in the kingdom. And we can neglect worship in the kingdom. You know, I'm reminded of, of Mary and Martha. And there was a time when Mary, she came and sat at Jesus' feet. And Martha was busy about serving. And, and she said to Jesus, she said, you know, Jesus, can't you say something to my sister about coming in and helping with all the tasks? All the things that need to get done? And Jesus looked at Martha and he said, your sister Mary, she's chosen the better thing and it won't be taken away from her. She came and sat at Jesus' feet. She came and sat there to adore him, to worship him, to give reverence to her, to him. I called this the wisdom of worship because Proverbs 10, 9 and 10 tells us this. The fear of the Lord, the reverential fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I believe that the beginning of all wisdom is at the place where we begin to worship God. It becomes the fountainhead. Worship becomes the fountainhead of wisdom. It causes me to begin to reflect the image of him that I worship. The God who we worship, we're changed into his image, the Bible says, from glory to glory. From glory to glory. We, we look unto Jesus. The Bible tells us that, that no man can see God except the Son. The Bible tells us, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus. 
The only way that I, I can look at the Father to even understand him is I have to look into the face of Jesus. And his radiant face, the face of Jesus, is reflecting the glory of God. See, we, we have come into a better covenant, not like that of, of the Old Testament with Moses. It says that he had to veil his face because the children of Israel, they could not look steadfastly into the glory of God. But we see Jesus and we can look into his face. You know, the Bible tells us to seek his face. That's what worship is. It's a time when I'm seeking the face of God. I'm looking for the very reflection of the glory of the Father to shine into our hearts. He says, the glory of his face shines into our hearts. This is why I said last night that worship becomes a lifestyle. Becomes a lifestyle. Because I've come to believe and I've come to accept and I've come become convinced by that there are there are only certain things that you can receive in the place of worship. Now, some people wouldn't want to agree with that. They say, you know, we can receive anything from God at any time, or maybe they think they've already received everything. I'm still receiving. I don't know about you, but I'm still receiving. I'm still being changed. I'm being changed into the image of his glory. Good evening, Apostle Arlen. I see you there tonight with me. I'm glad you're here. I'm thankful for worship. We can add this to our list of weapons. Apostle Arlen was talking about last week that many people are in a battle and that some people needed to praise and some people needed to plant. But I will tell you this, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and Worship is a weapon. Worship is a weapon. It's a weapon that gets me out of myself. It gets me out of the focus of myself. Good evening, Emmanuel. I'm glad you're here with me. See, I found that worship begins to point me in a direction of thought that is higher than my own. Something happens when I begin to transcend this, this earthly and my focus is focused upon the heavenly and him who is in heaven and him who is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Him whose name is above every name that is named. Him who every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It begins to point me into the direction of the thinking of the kingdom to something that is much higher than myself. This is the place where, where my, my thoughts change because this is the place where my thoughts begin to encounter his thoughts. And I already know that the Bible says that he says that my thoughts are not your thoughts and that my ways are not your ways because they are higher. See, worship causes us to begin to transcend this earthly and begin to move into the heavenly realm, the heavenly kingdom. This is how we are to live and to be minded. I'll take this further with you tonight. 
A true champion understands. A true champion. He understands who and what he worships. He understands who he's worshiping, and he understands why he's worshiping. See, worship's not a song. The church has made a mistake of calling it praise and worship. No, it's songs. I can worship God with a song, but a song doesn't mean that I've worshiped. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle because it, it is a source for me. It is a supply for me. It, it begins to shape who I'm becoming. It, it shifts all of my focus and, and it settles me into the atmosphere of heaven. See, a, a true champion, a true champion understands what is at the very center of his life. And what's at the center of my life is God Almighty. Whatever you worship is at the center of your life. Whatever, whatever, you, you, you may not know what you worship. Jesus told the woman at the well, he said, you, you don't know what you worship. She said, we worship in this mountain. And the Jews say we should worship in that mountain. Jesus said, it's not in either one of these places. He said, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is searching. God is searching for worshipers. Not because he needs them, but because they need him. A true worshiper. I ask you that tonight. Are you a true worshiper? See, I'm, I'm convinced you can be a believer, but not a worshiper. You can attend a worship service and never worship. You can be on a praise and worship team and never worship. You can be a worship leader and not really worship. You just may be a song leader. You can be spiritual and not be a worshiper. But the Father is seeking worshipers. The Father is seeking worshipers. I want to be a true worshiper. Authentic. Authentic. That everything that I do corresponds to the aspect of worship. That whatever I do, it gives the idea that I am a worshiper. Not something that, that I'm pretending, not something that is fictitious, but that I'm a true worshiper. That's what I aspire to be, a worshiper. We aspire to be many things. But have we aspired to be worshipers? I appreciate you joining me tonight. I'm Dr. Todd Williams, and I'm guest hosting Wisdom Talk tonight, and I'm talking to you about the wisdom of worship. The wisdom of worship. <coughs> There's a certain wisdom that we receive from worship that we can't get from any other place because it comes from out of the presence of the Lord. There's a certain weaponry, or I'll say that worship begins to weaponize us in a way that nothing else can. I believe many times this is why David was so successful. King David, because before he was ever king, before he ever fought Goliath, before he ever fought the Philistines, he was first and foremost a worshiper, and that's evident. He wrote one of the largest, the largest portion of scripture, the Psalms, and they're all about the worship of the Lord. Psalms is the largest book in the Bible. It's right in the middle. I mean, it's the... The, the message in the middle of the book. Don't forget in your devotion this week. Don't forget during your time of prayer, during your time of, of Bible study, to pause and take some time to just worship the Lord. Just give him worship. 
I don't come for any other reason this morning, God, but just to worship you. I, I'm just going to worship you. I'm just going to come and love on you and give thanks to you and gratitude. Tell him all the things that, that he means to you. Isn't it great when you're adored, when someone adores you? I know that feeling. And I am sure that when God's children give adoration to him, it blesses him in such a way. It blesses him in such a way. That's what I want to be known for. Thank you for joining me tonight. I do want to encourage you, everyone who watches this, if you're watching this live or watching this by replay, I want to encourage you to go to paulcrites.com. There's a lot of resources there for you. There's books by Dr. Paul Kreitz and Dr. Angel Kreitz that are available to you. You can click on the resource tab and it will take you to, there are both uh, printed books, there are audio books, and there are also digital books available at paulkreitz.com. I want to encourage you as well to sow your seed. If you've been a monthly partner with Dr. Kreitz, a $33 a month partner, I want to encourage you during the month of April to continue to do that. Uh, also, if you have not, if you're part of Purpose International and you're under that covering, I want to encourage you to tithe, send your tithes to uh, Paul Kreitz at paulkreitzgott.com. It will also, there's a link to PayPal. You can sew through PayPal or you can use Cash App and that's dollar sign Dr. Paul Kreitz, dollar sign Dr. Paul Kreitz. Or if you are mailing a check to them, if you want to sow a seed or an offering, you can do that at P.O. Box 121, St. Augustine, Florida, 32085. I encourage you and I challenge you this month in the month of April to sow your best seed. Dr. Kreitz, I'm sure, has many financial obligations at this moment and we can be a great blessing to him and his household. And we want to do that. And we want to do that speedily. All right. So tomorrow night, 8 p.m., my wife, April Williams, will be joining you for Wisdom Talk. You don't want to miss that. I know that she has a fantastic word to bring to you that will encourage your heart. And then Wednesday and Thursday night, you do not want to miss Apostle Dr. Arlen Smith as he will be guest hosting uh, Wisdom Talk. I know that he always has a phenomenal word, and I look forward to listening to both of those broadcasts and seeing you there as well. I'm signing off for this week. Lord willing, I will see you back next Sunday night at 8 p.m. for Wisdom Talk, and I look forward to seeing you with me. Until then, have a great week, family. Love you all. Bye-bye for now.